and welcome back to From My Mom's Basement, the podcast where I record short stories that are coming straight from my mom's basement. Um, this is the fifth episode in the podcast, and I'm your host, David Chamberlain. Sorry about missing last week. Uh, I've just been really busy, and I needed to catch up on a few things. Anyways, why don't we just dive right in? Um, the short story this week is called The Execution of Sergeant Bolton. Um, and just a content warning, there is some language and some mature content, so be advised. Um, this was written by me, David Chamberlain. Thank you. The land here is dry and unforgiving. It's taken us nearly three weeks to navigate this mountain pass, and we've lost three men in that time. When winter comes, she'll take us all, if any of us are still alive. Each mile we have traveled has been earned by blood and sweat and pure determination. There is no time to rest here, no respite or shelter from the elements. We are so low on ammunition now that if even a small band of savages were to attack us, we would be overtaken immediately. Our only hope is to rendezvous with the men of the 12th Regiment and hopefully find our way back to Fort Allen. There we could regroup and reevaluate the given objective. At this moment, it would not only be folly to launch the expedition any further, but it would be altogether quite impossible. My four platoons have slowly shrunk in the past month. More die each week. Of my non-commissioned officers, only one has enough command of his faculties to make coherent orders. Two of my other sergeants have fallen. One from disease, the other we hung from a pine tree. It is this subject, the execution of Sergeant Bolton, that I must write upon. An officer cannot speak of his doubts to an enlisted man, and I have found that if I do not speak of this incident to someone, I may go mad. Lieutenant Daniels was lost to a gangrenous infection after his leg was injured during a savage ambush, and so I find no proper man to express my thoughts of regret and melancholy. My hope is that perhaps these pages could stand as a proxy in the stead of a more suitable confidant. It is my sincerest wish that by relaying the events of Bolton's demise as clearly and as objectively as possible, that this guilt that has plagued me every second of every hour since his execution will be somewhat lessened. I will now entreat you, you, these worn pieces of parchment, with the tale of Sergeant Bolton and the events that led to his death. My company stole out of Fort Allen in August of 1868. We were part of a small outfit of expeditionary forces commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Forrester of the 5th Army Division. Under my charge were 145 men, including four platoon sergeants, a second lieutenant, that was Daniels, and a company commander, that of course being myself. My company was charged with a clandestine task that would include mountaineering, surveying, and even spying upon any indigenous peoples that lived along the Rocky Mountain Corridor. Several small teams were to make detailed observations of savage settlements and activity and were to then immediately return to Fort Allen to relay the information and await orders. Short Colonel Forrester, who was only a first lieutenant at the Battle of Gettysburg, briefed us all before we left. The job is simple, boys. Find out where these redskins eat, where they sleep, hell, even where they piss, and then report it back to me. You see, if you have a house to clean up, it sure helps to know where you need to clean. Once we have a general understanding of their activity, we'll ride out in full force. We'll clean up the house. About five miles out of Fort Allen, my men and I split from the rest of the battalion and began to head in a more southerly direction. A mile from there, and we were completely isolated. Due to the nature of our trip, we had brought no horses with us. We only carried what we could on our backs. The idea was to mirror the enemy in a way, to think the way a savage would think. My men were strong and capable and very young. My four sergeants were powerful and intimidating and were able to quickly make any private feel small. That's a trait I look for in a sergeant. The sergeant in question, Sergeant First Class Bolton, was quick and formal and a little too intelligent for his given position. It was widely thought and perhaps expected that he would one day buck for a commission. However, his intelligence never led to the slightest insubordination or indignation and I often leaned on his knowledge and wisdom more so than I did on Lieutenant Daniels. As much as I liked the young officer, he was a likable half-wit. It was his family's prominence that led him to a position of leadership, not any kind of innate ability. Nevertheless, Daniels had such a positive outlook that it seemed to boost my company's morale as a whole, and that is a gift that mere intelligence cannot provide. He was an invaluable asset to me, even if Bolton was far more useful when it came to military stratagem. 
After three days of marching, we reached a small valley. The thick forest opened up to a lush river valley that was filled with all manner of savage habitation. My men and I stood on the edge of the valley and watched for possibly an hour or two, watched their movements, their conventions. I whispered to Bolton and asked for his advice. You see, we were ordered to keep marching, keep moving on south until we reached the edge of the Uinta mountain range. If we could march through the valley, we could have possibly cut one or maybe even two days from our journey, but that would mean engaging in combat. The rules of engagement were blurred in this expedition. Colonel Forrester had advised us to stay clear of any active combat, but to cut down the enemy when and where absolutely necessary. I whispered to Bolton, What do you suppose? How many fighting men do they have? Captain, if they had any fighting men, we would have been killed an hour ago. Don't underestimate these redskins, Captain. It would be my guess that the men are out on some kind of hunting party. Leaving the women and children alone? That seems frightfully ignorant. They haven't met the U.S. Army yet, sir. What do they have to be afraid of? Do we have a looking glass? Yes, sir. I'll retrieve it for you. Bolton returned to my side a few moments later with a looking glass. Peering through the glass, I saw that perhaps Bolton was right. There were no men. The oldest male savage in the village was perhaps twelve years old, no more than a child. I returned the glass to Sergeant Bolton and whispered, Tell your platoon and notify the other sergeants that we will be marching straight through the valley. No one is to engage with the savages unless provoked. Is that understood? Yes, sir, but perhaps, perhaps we should wait a moment longer. You, you never know. We need to keep moving. Yes, sir. In mere moments, my men were ready to march, and that's exactly what we did. Upon first sighting us, the women savages took to their huts and makeshift shelters and huddled in their darkest corners, shielding their young with their own flesh. The white men who had come before were not so kind. We marched through their village quietly, and dare I say respectfully. Not one of my men behaved in a way to embarrass myself or my outfit. As the last of my men were exiting the forest and entering the valley, an arrow flew by my ear and lodged itself into the neck of Lance Corporal Dawson, who was no more than two feet away from me. Blood sprinkled my cheek. It was eerily quiet. Dawson choked and clawed at himself and fell prostrate on the ground. When I turned to see where the arrow had come from, a dozen more of the projectiles were already mid-flight and worming their way into the blue uniforms that stood like open targets made for their entertainment. I can't be sure how many men were lost in that initial barrage, but at least a third of us had been wounded before the first savage warrior was even spotted. Daniels had the shaft of an arrow protruding from his mid-thigh, but was still barking orders like a drill sergeant. I was on my stomach, loading my rifle and trying to wipe Dawson's blood off my face when close to five dozen savages, painted in elaborate and terrifyingly wonderful war paint, burst from the tree line in what I can only describe as an eruption of beauty and death. I saw it in my men's eyes. Everyone saw it. Even I saw it. They were beautiful. We had seen nothing like it before. They were so terrible. So delightfully terrible. They sprung down on us with such speed and intensity that we couldn't help but admire them. We were hypnotized. Their hollering filled our ears. Drums beat somewhere. I struggled to find words. Then the world turned gray with gun smoke. The savages chanting broke into confused screaming, and they broke formation, that is, if they ever had one. Bolton and his men flanked on the left, Sergeant Toole flanked them from behind, and they were surrounded in minutes. It would have done them better if they had stayed hidden in the tree line and slowly killed us from the shadows. But as I have learned, the savages many things, and a coward isn't one of them. They fought to the last man. Private Williams finally took his standard-issue knife and pressed it through the back of the last living warrior. It was silent again. I want a casualty count, I called out. And if there's any wounded, see if one of these redskin girls can't sew them up. We had lost 26 men. 13 more were wounded. I had led my men into an ambush. And while the others were regrouping and I found myself alone, I hid behind one of the huts and wept. Bolton called for me. Captain! What is it? I came from behind the hut. I had something of an idea, if you would humor me. What is it? I asked again. What if we were to take one of these women as a guide of sorts? Maybe she could point out the right paths to go down and, and such. Do any of them speak English? No, I, I don't believe so, sir. Does any one of us speak Injun? Um, no, sir. Then what kind of help could they be? I'm, I'm sure we could arrange some kind of system, sir. 
I can't afford to bring along some savage girl who will end up doing more harm than good. Sir, with all due respect, forget it. Check on your men. We march in an hour. The twelve-year-old boy I saw through the looking glass had been shot with an arrow. He was lying in the mud with his dead eyes staring into the sky. I could have sworn he was smiling. An hour later we were marching, and three hours later we found ourselves in the woods on the other side of the valley. And as night began to fall, I thought it wise to settle for camp. I smoked my pipe as I watched two privates struggle to construct my tent. One of the perks of being an officer, I suppose. That night, I woke to the sound of screaming. It was a woman. I walked out of my tent to find the men on watch were as confused as I was. Where's that coming from? I asked. They shrugged their shoulders. We don't know, sir, one of them said. There was another scream. It was close by. Follow me, I said. Not more than a hundred yards from our camp, I discovered Sergeant Bolton forcing himself onto a native woman, a knife pressed against her throat. Bolton was so caught up in his lust that he failed to notice myself or the two men with me. Keep quiet or I'll slice you open, he whispered. He continued to exercise his dominance over her, completely oblivious of my existence. Get Bolton off that woman, I ordered. Bolton turned and jumped to his feet, his pants still around his ankles. The woman screamed again. Her body was contorted and twisted in the moonlight. My men grabbed Bolton and the woman fled into the darkness before any one of us could stop her. I thought that was for the best. I followed closely behind Bolton as he was dragged back to camp. Keep watch over him tonight. Don't wake me till morning. I need my rest, I said. And don't let him talk. The next morning was crisp and windy. I woke with the dawn. Bolton was on his knees, his eyes red and irritated. I remember asking him, My boy, what have you done? And he stared at me, almost in a drunken stupor, and said, she was a savage, sir, no more human than one of those squirrels in the trees. So you approve of the practice of bestiality, I asked. He shuddered. Of course not, sir. You, how did you bring her along with us? You directly disobeyed my orders. Sir, please, I, I, I don't think I did, I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. You can request a panel for your court-martial, or I can be your sole judge. Court-martial? Court-martial, sir, we have a job to do. Court-martial? She was a savage, a, a dumb squaw, Captain. You, you're really getting on me for that? We don't have time for this. Bolton stood as if he were going to grab his gear and begin to march. You're accurate in that statement, I said. We don't have time for this, so we'll have to make it quick. The other men in my company were beginning to wake and surround us. Take down the camp. We move in an hour, I called out. One of my other sergeants, Staff Sergeant Toole, approached me. What seems to be? He noticed the rope tied around Bolton's wrists. Sir, what's happening? Follow me. I took Toole with me, as well as a few other men, and we found a quiet place away from the camp. It was a clearing near the pinnacle of a small incline. There was a single pine tree, the one that the sergeant would be hung from. The wind was harsh, I remember. Our cheeks were red, and our hair was tossed in all directions. There was no protection from the elements, and we were all so tired, so incredibly tired. One of my men yawned as I was initiating the tribunal. I looked up from the top of the hill, and in the far distance I could have sworn I saw the tribe of now widows burying their dead. I began the proceedings, but I had to clear my voice and speak as loudly as I could as the wind was so harsh I could hardly be heard. Sergeant First Class Josiah Bolton. A disciplinary court has been established in your name in an effort to judiciously provide punishment for misconduct and criminal behavior. I am your sole judge and jury and will be presiding over this court. You will be awarded no counsel in your defense. Is that understood? This is outrageous! Your men know this is outrageous! This is taking up precious time! Sergeant, you have been charged with insubordination and the assault and rape of a woman civilian. You directly disobeyed orders and conspired against your commanding officer. As such, the court finds the punishment for your crimes to be death, if you are found guilty. Well, well, of course I'll be found guilty. Th this is bullshit. This is... Captain, what are you... This... This... I know what this is about. You may make a statement in your defense, but be aware that any statement you make may be used against you in this court. Yeah. Yeah, I have something to say. I know what this is about. 
This is about the men we lost yesterday. The men we lost because of your orders. We weren't... We had orders not to engage. This, this was a scouting mission. Scouting! You walked us right through the valley of death for no clear reason. You're afraid Colonel Forrester will find out. What are you going to do? Kill us all? Yeah. Yeah, I'll say a few words in my defense. Yeah, listen to this. She was a prairie nigger, Captain. Simple as that. She couldn't spell rape if you asked her. She's probably been raped her whole life by her savage counterparts, anyhow. She don't know anything different. How many men here have done the same thing? If what I did last night was a sin, if what I'd done was rape, well, I hate to break it to you, Captain, but this company, hell, this regiment, this army is full of sinful rapists, and I'd be sad to be a part of it. You can't pick and choose. You can't. Either we're all bound for hell or none of us is, including me. I can't say that what I'd done was wrong. I can't. And by my estimation, I don't think you can make a proper case against me. I did disobey your orders, Captain, to that I can admit to. But nothing so much as to warrant my execution. I am a fine soldier. You know it, Captain. You know you need me. Captain, if you execute me this day, your soul will be on a quicker path to hell than mine. The wind roared up at the end of his speech, and I remember Sergeant Toole looking wide-eyed and scared. I was shaking. I cannot recall if it was from the cold or from fear, but I made sure to keep my hands out of sight. Sergeant, you show no remorse for your crimes, and your pride in the face of this court is disdainful and sickens me. You have not denied your offenses or made any case in your defense whatsoever. Because of this and the evidence put against you, I find you guilty of all crimes and charges. I, Captain Thomas Everett of the 5th Infantry Division of the Army of the United States of America, hereby sentence you to hang by the neck until dead. May God have mercy on your soul. Bolton began to scream obscenities and vulgarities, all of which were directed at me. Don't let him speak, I ordered, and in a few moments Bolton was gagged. Sergeant Toole acted as executioner. As he led Bolton to the decided pine tree, which would act as a gallows, he turned to me. Sir, we don't have a rope. What about the rope around his wrists? No, sir, those need to be bound, else he'll flail all about as he's suffocating. Here. I unlatched the leather belt that wrapped around my waist. I'm sure this will work. Tool nodded and quickly made the proper knots. One of the privates there acted as a stepping stool and crouched down on all fours as Bolton stood atop of him, leather noose around his neck. Then I remember the most peculiar thing happening. The wind died down. There was not even the slightest breeze. It was silent. It was the quietest moment I think I have ever experienced. We... All of us stood there looking at each other, looking at Bolton, who now had tears on his cheeks. Tool broke the silence. Any last words? No, he doesn't get to speak, I ordered. Yes, sir. I nodded to the shivering private to move, and he crawled away, leaving Bolton suspended in midair. Tool was right. He did flail. He struggled for much longer than I had thought possible. Perhaps the belt was not the most effective of nooses, then, like the slowing of a great locomotive, his movements turned sluggish and became labored, and finally, they stopped altogether. I began walking back to camp before he was taken from the tree. Sir, one of the privates called out to me. Should we bury him? I don't care what you do with him, I called back. And we continued marching, continued to this day, to this time, to this moment. Now... My company is a skeleton. My men are angry with me, with their situation. I hear whispers of mutiny, and I cannot seem to place any blame on them. We are lost, and we are dying, and my inner conflicts are slowly tearing me at the seams. And I am wearing a belt that killed one of my own men. Thank you for listening to this episode of From My Mom's Basement. Um, this episode was written, edited, and produced by me, David Chamberlain. And the music is by Kevin McLeod. Thank you.